Jesus' name. Amen. Sermon's called Heads or Tails. Call it. Craig wins and the rest of you lose. <laughs> which, which is exa exactly my confusion since I was a child. <laughs> um, heads or tails, right? It always kind of puzzled me because, you know, I got the heads. The, you know, the queen was on one side. But then on the other side was like a beaver or it was like a sailboat or something. And I was like, or, or the witch? The blue nose, exactly. That's a sailboat. And or it was uh, there was the head of a, an elk, I think, or on one side, you know. So, so which head are we talking about? It's the head of the elk or the head of the queen? You know, it's kind of confusing. So somebody explained to me at some point that well, you know, head heads and tails are the opposites of each other. So that's why they, they call it that. <laughs> but but actually, the, the Craig, you can have this back after. <laughs> it won't get anywhere if it's in this plane. Uh, coin flipping goes back a long, long time. So coins have been around since about at least six or seven hundred BC, um, and uh, and you know we, we've got samples of the archaeologists have, have dug up samples from the Middle East and China and India and all these places, uh, and it definitely goes back to the time of Julius Caesar. In fact, the rumor is that Julius Caesar it was a, it was a kind of a kids game back. They called it heads and ships in, in Latin, of course, back in in Caesar's day. And uh, the, but the rumor is that sometimes Julius Caesar would decide legal matters with a flip of the coin. <laughs> okay. I think, sometimes I think they still do that today, but no. So uh, a little context to the passage. Gwen kind of kicked it off there, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper with that. So this is Luke chapter 20. And if you were here last week, we, did, we, we, we were on that. Uh, so we, we're, we're leading up, oddly enough, this is the chapter that's leading up to the passion of Christ. It leads up to the, the, uh, the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion of Christ, uh, it, which follow, starts following like in the next couple of chapters, which is kind of funny because we're, we're actually coming up to Advent where we'll kind of go back to the beginning and the birth of Christ and, uh, you know, and the second coming of Christ. We'll be talking about that. Um, uh, you, you'd think this part might be just before Easter. But, but no, so, so there's this period of time when Jesus came to Jerusalem just before his passion. And uh, the triumphant entry is in the, the, the previous chapter in Luke, Luke 19. And then it, it, it appears that he stayed in Jerusalem, like, or he was in Jerusalem for about a week, uh, going back and forth outside the city to the, the Mount of Olives. And he would stay there overnight. He had friends there where he would stay. He would come back into the city each day. And he would teach in the temple, in the temple grounds. And uh, it, it appears that it was a time where there was a lot of, uh, he, he, he was in a lot of arguments. And there was a lot of <laughs> strife between him and the, and the leaders at this point. And, and Luke 20 seeks to show us that. So actually, just before, uh, the other thing he did after he came into the city, uh, the, the triumphant entry, also known as Palm Sunday, was he cleansed the temple, if you recall. So he overthrew the temples and, you know, drove out the animals, and, or not the temples, he overthrew the, the tables of the money changers within the temple grounds, and uh, they, they weren't happy. So then it says, so this is the last bit of chapter 19, every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Now, this gives you a bit of the scenario. So he's very, very popular. People want to listen to him and hear him. They're crowding around. And so the people that want to kill him, Luke doesn't mince words here, they're having trouble because, you know, he's so popular. They, they don't want to themselves become unpopular by, by doing something. So they, they're trying to do it in tricky ways. Um, now, this is a little aside that you may or may not be interested in. This is, this is a, you know you how in your magazine you have that sidebar of related topics? Okay, so this has nothing to do with the sermon. <laughs> I just learned this recently. So I, I've been a long time interested in Bible translation. I may have told you this. At one point I thought, maybe I'll be a Bible translator. That'd be cool. Wycliffe Bible Translators was very appealing to me. Uh, I never pursued it, but I did take linguistics at university for a, a couple of years, uh, which is kind of the study of the science of languages. But anyways, reading recently in Christianity Today, which is a magazine that I get, that it would appear that the Gospel of Luke, which we're reading today, Luke is 
probably arguably the most translated book of the entire Bible into more languages than any other. And that's a recent development because what's happened is that, uh, you know, the resources of the Bible translators have been stretched pretty thin. And so they look for ways to help support their, 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 this ministry and this great work. There, there, are, still, there are still dialects uh, around, quite a few, which have not, some of them have not even been written down yet. So they have to learn how to write them, like develop an orthography, as they call it, and then, you know, start translating the Bible. And they're much more, to a much greater extent nowadays, they use the people that, you know, actually know the language, the people that are uh, indigenous to wherever they're, they're translating. But the thing is, they needed support. So there's a thing called the Jesus film. Have you guys ever seen it or heard of it? Wow. <laughs> a few years ago, it was huge. And it is huge worldwide. It's hugely used to teach people about Jesus. It's a film based on the book of Luke. And it just basically is word for word-ish uh, based on the book of Luke. So they, these two have partnered together. This, the Bible translators have partnered together with the, uh, the Jesus film people. And, of course, the first thing they translate is the book of Luke. So <laughs> the book of Luke now is, is the first thing translated, then other, the, after that, other New Testament books and Old Testament books. I don't know if you care, but anyway, thought, thought, you know, I'll let you know. So Bible translation is ongoing. The Jesus film. Yeah. Film, yeah. It's a, and we have, we have a copy or two here, but, except I think it's on VHS, and I, which they've uninvented. <laughs> Rene Benoit is the only one that's got a VCR anymore. So, <laughs> movie night. Maybe we should we should do that. Okay. Anyway, moving on. So here's the question. Well, so the background. Once again, Luke is telling us exactly the situation. Spies are there. <laughs> Luke says, "Who pretended to be honest?" <laughs> Which I think is hilarious. Don't they always pretend to be honest? But anyway. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So this is clearly trying to catch him up. Um, this is not the first time. That, uh, Gwen alluded to this at the very beginning of the chapter. They, they came up and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answers the question with a question. I'll ask you a question. John's baptism, from heaven or from men, from people? Was it human or, or, or divine? And they don't want to answer that because they'll be unpopular. So <laughs> he says, that I'm not telling you the answer to that either. And then the set, some of you were here last week. Remember we talked about the Sadducees. They're trying to catch him up on the whole, the riddle of the, um, uh, the, the woman, the widow, uh, who had seven husbands. And, what, you know, in the resurrection, you know, who will be her husband? Which one of the seven? And so you remember that from last week, right? Yeah, sure. Good golly. I know what it's like to be a teacher. Feel your pain. <laughs> Feel your pain. <laughs> um, so, so, so here they're trying to trick him. Uh, and so the spies question him. This is great. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Weren't they so nice? You know, they buttered him right up, you know. <laughs> if it was any of the rest of us, we'd feel pretty, you know, puffed up and thinking, wow, yeah, these people like me. They, they you know, they, they got a handle on what I'm all about. And then they blast, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? <laughs> so you know, they butter him up and then they stick the knife in. And it, it, so th this may not seem like a problem to you, but it's a huge problem in Jesus' context, in his world. So amongst the Jews, the Jews were under the, the thumb of the Romans at this point. And many of them did not like that. In fact, probably most, if not all, didn't like it. And some were, were you know, zealously trying to, to extract the nation from Roman rule. They were called, some of them were called zealots. They were revolutionaries. And there were all kinds of re revolutions happening. A lot of the crucifixions that, that you know, historically happened were of people who were leading insurrections. And not very long after this, so this is, this is 30, -ish, 30 AD ish, by 70 AD, another huge insurrection happens from the, the you know, Jewish leaders bring about this rebellion, and Rome comes and squashes it uh, brutally. And then many, many die, and they tear down the temple stone from stone, and the walls, and you know, they burn a lot of Jerusalem. 
So uh, that's the context here. You have people that really don't, well, they hate, they hate the Roman rule, and they really do not believe in paying taxes. So, <laughs> so th this question, if Jesus says one thing, you know, he can raise the ire of so many people who hate the Romans. Yeah, you should pay your taxes. <laughs> On the other, if he says, don't pay your taxes, they have something to go and, and tell the authorities about that can get them arrested. Right? So what's he going to do? So that's, that's, uh, that's the trick question. So the answer is, show me a coin. Who's, whose likeness and inscription is this? Caesar's. Okay, well. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and, and there, it says, they were unable to trap him in what he said. They were astonished, and they became silent. So what, what's that all about? Now, see, the one he doesn't really answer the question, does he? He doesn't give them a nice simplistic answer, which is what they were hoping for. Don't we love simplistic answers? <laughs> we do. Uh, but it, gee, and I think this is a wonderful kind of demonstration of Jesus calling us to be, be people that think for ourselves. Because we don't want to do that. We want to have a simply laid out, cut and dry. Uh, and, uh, you know, God has given us a whole lot of resources and capacities in order that we might actually consider things for ourselves. We do like simplistic answers. The appeal of many religions and even many versions of the Christian faith, I think, uh, it, you know, is simplistic answers. So I may be way in line here, but, you know, to me, to a large degree, uh, the, the religion of Islam is, <coughs> is very appealing to people because it just sets out, there's a, you know, here's the five pillars, do them. Or, uh, now, Jehovah's Witness. I've, I've studied it over the years, and... Uh, uh, nothing is wonderful people around here who are Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the belief system that they, they hold to. And, uh, you know, it is one of those things where here's, here's the directions. Just do it. Like, you know, you, you, part of your job is going to be you have to go door to door. Part of your job is, you know, you're not, you're not going to be uh, uh, no blood transfusions for you. You better not be celebrating Christmas. And, you know, any other questions you have, you've got to get the answer straight down from the Watchtower Society. <laughs> and... There's not a whole lot of encouragement to think things through for yourself. Here is the interpretation. And, and it's been, you know, Chris, Chris, the Christian churches over the years and the centuries have also displayed this kind of, you know, let's get some pat answers so everybody will know how they should behave and what they're supposed to do. You may remember the time, or you have heard of the time, when within the church or churches, basically it was, you know, it was a lot of don'ts. <laughs> Don't drink, don't smoke, don't play cards, don't gamble, don't go to movies, don't dance, etc., etc. And maybe you better get to church three times on Sunday and maybe once in the middle of the week. Um, remember those times? That, that, was, that was, you know, and you could get in trouble with your peers if you didn't actually abide by those. But the Roman Catholics have, have it down to of science a little bit, you know. <laughs> Thou must go to Mass. Or you have sinned if you have not gone, and you will have to come to confession. I, I, I noticed this a few years ago. I was on a, my sabbatical, and I was visiting different churches, so I thought I'd go to the Catholic Church in Minden, and I did. It was, it was a great experience, but it was full to the gunnels. It was just chock full of people that I'm going Catholic, because they, they have to come to church. <laughs> so when everyone conforms to the group think, and what they're told to think, it starts to look like a cult. Right? And we, we tend to that because it's easy. Uh, you know, over the years, my experience and the experience of many other Christian leaders, pastors and ministers and elders and priests and stuff, is people will ask us these questions because they want the simple answer. Right? Like, you know, sh sh am I allowed to have an alcoholic beverage? Can I drink? I'm supposed to tell them? <laughs> Nowadays, marijuana is, you know, cannabis is legal. Can I use cannabis? Um, a thing out there is, you know, MAID, um, medical assistance in death and dying. You know, is that, can I go with that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you could just get a nice, clear, straight answer, as opposed to actually thinking these through for themselves. So the beauty, the beauty of, of real, genuine Christian faith, but at the same time, the risk of it, the danger of it, if you will. So it's beauty, wonder, but also risky, is that there is freedom. We've been given amazing freedom. 
And we're to take individual responsibility for our choices. We're to think humbly, prayerfully, and deeply about issues we confront, okay, and, and, and make up our minds, but also graciously allow others to have different viewpoints. I've underlined that because I want to repeat that because that's a problem today in churches. We've got it right, and those guys are wrong, and uh, I'm not even going to talk to them. No, that is not the attitude of Christ. We, we may come to quite different conclusions about some things, but we're called to love our brothers and our sisters, uh, graciously allowing others to have different viewpoints. We've seen that in the last few years in a big way. We have as resources to aid us in, in uh, you know, thinking and learning the Scriptures, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Christ gives the Holy Spirit to all those who, who come to faith in him. Our consciences... We have consciences, and we have intuition. Even men have intuition. Did you know that? <laughs> just because they never use it doesn't mean they don't have it. No. Sometimes you just call it, you know, going, going by my gut. Kind of thing, you know, just got a feeling. Um, and our God-given minds. And in fact, not only are they God-given, they're God-inspired in many. So if, we, if you belong to Christ, if you're in Christ, according to Paul, in his, one of his letters, I forget which one, he says, we have the mind of Christ, he says. We have the mind of Christ. So we, we have the full equipment to sort things out on our own. So I, I just think that that's, that's implicit in this passage, that Jesus is calling people to think, because he does not give a clear answer. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. So what, what is Caesar's and what is God's? What is that? Well, some things are pretty clear, I think, uh, pretty obvious. One is the, the issue at point here, which is, you know, should we pay taxes? Yes. <laughs> I think it's pretty, I don't know that I have a choice, frankly, or I, I guess I can go to jail or something, but that's not much of a choice. And, you know, as, as the church uh, was, became more and more established, um, the teaching became more and more clear. So Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 13, says this unequivocally. Uh, it's a whole chapter, on, well, a whole, I think, eight verse, seven or eight, seven verses on this subject. He says, everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So it's interesting. We may think, you know, government's evil sometimes, but according to Scripture, government is established and under, the, under God. So, so in a sense... The, the dichotomy that Jesus presents, either you know, render to Caesar what Caesar's, or to God what is, what, what is God's, is not quite, I mean, there's more to it. I mean, it, it, because even what is Caesar's is God's. It's all the things that, the, the power that Caesar has, the authority Caesar has, uh, the position Caesar is from God, and they are answerable, uh, answerable to God. Um, he goes on, I'm not going to read the whole, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. There it is again. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So at this point... Paul is spelling it out fairly clearly, <laughs> what it might mean to render to Caesar what is Caesar. And uh, Peter, St. Peter, in I think it's his first epistle, says something very, very similar. Um, now, besides that, there's things like, I don't know, jury duty, right? Government calls you to jury duty, what are you going to do? No, nah, I don't want to. No, you, you got to go show up. Um, and uh, that's part of rendering to Caesar. You may be able to wiggle out of it for whatever reason. I've wiggled out twice now and haven't. You know, but, you know, I, I do believe it's my duty to go, but uh, it's, it's not very convenient. <laughs> Participating in elections, you know, so that's not, that's not something you have to do. But, uh, you know, in, in our job, it, what, uh, what, I call, what I call Caesar here, I just mean all governments, right? Whether federal, provincial, municipal, <clears throat> all of that, that's Caesar in our, in our system. Um, participating in elections. I mean, you know, as Christians that, that seek to be responsible citizens of a country, uh, we, we have the freedom to not vote, but we also have the freedom to vote. 
You know, we, we have that privilege. So, you know, I, I, it's a responsible way to exercise our, our liberty. Respecting laws and law enforcement officers who have been disrespected quite a bit in some, some instances of late. Um, you know, that's rendering to Caesar. <clears throat> but then it gets a little bit, you know, harder to discern. Things like, what about drafted military service? We don't have it right now. I had four sons, so I was kind of glad that was the case. And one joined the military anyway. But uh, you know, back in the Second World War, we had we had drafted service, right, uh, for for part of that. Um, and there are Christian sects or uh, sections of the Christian Church, like the Mennonites, who are uh, out there as being pacifists, saying, you know, we we will not we will not go forward for military duty, and we're willing to go to jail if that's the the price we have to pay. And we know certainly back in the, the Vietnam days when they were the draft was in the states. There were a whole lot of people who were trying to dodge the draft. They were, they were conscientious objectors, and some of them came to Canada to dodge the draft. <clears throat> big, big issue in uh, not that long ago. So, you know, okay. And what about Caesar's questionable decisions and actions when they do stuff that we're, eh, kind of makes us wonder, do we have to support that? Like recently there was, you know, things like mask mandates. You may have heard of that. And some people weren't very happy about that. And, you know, the Emergency Measures Act, which was, you know, enacted just this year, um, you know, and, and people have taken, taken issue with that sort of thing. And, and uh, what about protesting against that stuff? Or civil disobedience, even. Sit-downs and, and blocking, blocking pipeline building or blocking uh, uh, the, the foresting of these ancient, huge redwoods in BC and stuff like that. All that stuff has gone on. Where do, we, where do you stand on that? It's not as crystal clear as you might think. Um, and, and civil disobedience actually happens in Scripture. Uh, for instance, well, go back to the book of Daniel, we'll see what happened there. But even in the New Testament, in, in the early, early church, when the disciples began to proclaim the gospel, they got called up before the authorities. And the authorities said, okay, you got to... They, in some cases, they whipped them or beat them. And then they said, okay, you can no longer go about talking about Jesus. They, went, they got back together. They had a big prayer time. They said, okay, now what's right? To do what God tells us or to do what people tell us to do? And they went back out and started talking about Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, it says. So that was civil disobedience. And it still happens today because all across this fair world that we live in, there has been a lot of persecution of people who, who will proclaim the gospel. And uh, they do it anyway, because they, they, they sense that it's God's calling. What if, what, if, uh, what if Hitler's the Fuhrer? What if, what if Adolf Hitler is the, the leader of your country? Right? <laughs> then, then what do you do? I mean, it says here, what did I just read? Uh, the rulers are ordained by God. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So he was a, a Lutheran minister in Germany during the Second World War. And a lot of the, a lot of the uh, clergy and churches just went along with whatever Hitler was say, saying. But, not, but a, a minority, a few were, were, were criticizing, and they were putting themselves at risk to do this, big risk. And uh, Bonhoeffer, who, who was a, a widely known uh, Christian teacher, writer, uh, a lot of his, his stuff's around today, people study it, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, <laughs> he got himself involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Can you imagine the, 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 the wrestlings of conscience he must have gone through to get himself involved with that? But he thought, just thought, knowing what he knew, that that was the right way to go. He, he, of course, it didn't happen. It was not successful. He was arrested, and he eventually died uh, in custody. Uh, that was the price he was ready to pay. So that, there's, there's some thinking for you to think about, you know, in rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's. What is God's? What is God's? You know, Jesus took the coin. He said, show me a coin. He said, you know, whose likeness and inscription is this? What if he grabbed one of his disciples and said to the crowd, whose likeness and image is this? Did you notice how those two are very, seem to be almost, to me, they seem related. Likeness and inscription, likeness and image. And they would have had to say, being good Jews who knew the scriptures, he's in the, this person is in the likeness of God. And then he could have said, okay, well, then render to God what is God's. 
and to Caesar what is Caesar's. If we render to Caesar taxes, then what we render to God is our whole selves. Paul says in, uh, I think it's Romans 12, he says, present your bodies, therefore, unto God as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable worship. Present your bodies to God as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable worship. You and I, we belong to God. We don't belong to ourselves. We, and it's not just our bodies. Uh, it's, it's our possessions. It's our time. It's our abilities. Everything. It's all God's. Everything is God's. And, you know, we struggle with that. We all have a lot of trouble with this. <laughs> you know, admitting that we are not our own. We belong to someone. We belong to God. We all have a lot of trouble with this, and we struggle with this until we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we come to the cross, we get to see God for who he really is and what he's really like. We get to see someone who not only cares about us and loves us, but he, he cares about us and loves us enough that he enters into our lives. He becomes one of us. He suffers with us. You know, he walks with us. He, uh, he sleeps and, and eats and drinks with us. And then he, uh, he lays down his life for us, sacrificially, that we might be completely forgiven. And, and that we might be reconciled and brought back to God. This is our Jesus. This is our God. So when we come to that, that point, that allows us to make the jump. Yeah, I, I, I can belong to such a one. Paul, Paul says it in uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's uh, 4 or 5, I think it is. He says, um, one died for all which means that all therefore have died. And he died for all, that they should live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died. It's just, it's just spiritual logic. But it comes from actually coming face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's the, the, the natural conclusion. So then we agree that what is truly owed to God is love. We don't owe that to Caesar. We don't owe that to the government. We really don't owe the government our love. We may owe obedience. We may owe respect. We may owe taxes. Okay, but not love. The God who made us, who cares for us, who dies for us, who gifts us, who forgives us, who longs for us, who waits for us with unconditional love. He deserves our love. That's what we render to God. Shall we pray?